Hello, everybody. In behalf of the MBSA Forum, I want to welcome you all to this session. I'm Diego Choa, MBSA Forum Communications Advisor. Thank you very much for attending our November webinar dedicated to whistleblower on illegal trade and uh, presented by the Stephen Kahn, Executive Director of the National Whistleblower Center in the United States. This webinar will explore how whistleblowers around the world can report wildlife crime and receive monetary awards under two U.S. legal instruments, the Lacey Act and the Endangered Species Act. These acts provide monetary incentives to persons who disclose information about wildlife crimes. In every arena where they have been properly implemented, these successful whistleblower reward laws have been profound in strengthening the ability of the government to detect and prosecute wildlife crime. In total, whistleblower reward laws worldwide have resulted, have resulted in over $50 billion in fines and penalties and over $3.5 billion in compensation to whistleblowers. Whistleblower reward laws can now be leveraged in the fight against international wildlife crime. I would like to introduce Mr. Stephen Kahn. Mr. Kahn is the Executive Director of the National Whistleblower Center in the United States and serves as the chair of the Whistleblowers Leadership Council. He has represented whistleblowers for over 30 years, establishing numerous precedents threatening whistleblowers' rights. Mr. Kong worked extensively with the U.S. Congress in drafting key whistleblower laws, including protections contained in the Servants Oxley, Dodd Frank, and Whistleblower Protection Enhancements Act. I would like to welcome Mr. Kong and thank you very much for attending this invitation. It is a pleasure to have you here. Dr. Kong, well, can you hear me? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to people from around the world about this exciting and important new development in the fight against illegal wildlife trafficking. Thank you, Mr. Before, uh, before starting, I just want to remind you, remind all our audience about some rules and dynamics in the MBSA Forum webinar. Remember, all the microphones will be muted during the presentation. This reduces interferences and facilitates the communication. We will have around one hour presentation, followed by 30 minutes of questions and discussions. Uh, please send us in advance your questions or raise your hand in the control panel of the GoToWebinar. If you want to speak and the connection as always, we will open the participants' microphones to promote interaction during the Q&A session. Um, as many of our participants are not English native speakers, me included, I would like to remind our speaker, Mr. Khan, the importance to talk slower. This fosters comprehension among our practitioners. This session is going to be recorded and it will be available in the MBSA forum, so remember to visit our website. All the participants will receive an email with a link to, to the recording as well as the PDF copy of this presentation and a list of resources related to the topic. Now, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Khan to start the presentation. Thank you very much, everybody, and please enjoy the session. Uh, Dr. Khan, uh, Mr. Khan, all yours. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to a worldwide audience about this new development, and I think a revolutionary development, in the ability to detect and wildlife crime and enforce the law. Just by way of background, the, the word whistleblower may be familiar to some of you, but it's a unique term and I'd like just to define it. If you go to this slide that's on now and to, to number two, it's really about anyone who reports a violation of law to an appropriate authority. In this context, we're talking about illegal wildlife trafficking 
These laws also cover bribery, corruption, tax fraud, and many other areas. It's about getting an insider, someone who has first-hand knowledge about the illegal activity and incentivizing them and protecting them if they report it. And, and the use of the whistleblower to detect and report crime is absolutely essential in the fight against corruption, as will be further explained. Based on other whistleblower laws and our review of how they've worked over the past 30 years, when whistleblower incentives are used in the fight against trafficking, there will be a massive increase in the detection of these crimes and the ability of law enforcement to tackle this problem. And it really centers and starts with the issue of who detects fraud, who detects crime. And there's two types of crime. If shot and killed, everyone knows there was a murder. The police are called. They may take fingerprints or DNA evidence. But other types of crime are designed to be hidden. If someone is smuggling wildlife, they don't tell people. It's hidden. If someone is buying illegal wildlife, they don't do that in the open. And poachers and, uh, and, and people who are out killing these animals or cutting down the forests, or illegal fishing, they don't publicize. Often their crimes are not seen. And therefore you need an insider. And let's see how this works. This chart on the PowerPoint, action method by region. It was put together by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, a trade association of approximately 24,000 auditors, compliance officials, people who work in the fraud detection area. And what they did was they surveyed how these types of crimes are detected. How do you find these things? If you don't know it's happening, if you don't know who is doing it, when they're doing it, how they're doing it, you can't stop it. So this just is the survey. And what you can see in the very first one is called TIP. TIP is the whistleblower. TIP is an inside source, someone with inside information alerting an authority that some type of crime has occurred. And if you see the color coding, you will see that no matter where you live in the world, be it the United States, be it Southern Asia, be it Asia Pacific, Wherever you live, the TIP is the number one source of all fraud detection. If you come all the way down, fourth to the bottom, you will see notified by law enforcement, averaging around 2%, where the TIP is between 45 to 50%. So if you're waiting for the police, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, for the Coast Guard, 
to catch these smugglers. You're going to be catching about 2% on a good day. So people who looked at these numbers, and they, they stay the same, they, they came out again in 2016, they're always the same, they concluded that if you want an effective anti-corruption program, you must incentivize the tip. The tip or the whistleblower is the key. And you must have a program that addresses this reality. In short, it is not a question of whether you like a whistleblower or support whistleblowing. It's not the question. The question is, is do you want an effective anti-corruption program? If so, you must have good detection. If so, you must have a whistleblower. This just shows the same, based on the same statistic, it's actually from the 2016 report, and it shows what we're talking about. Again, the tip was 43% of all detections, Internal audit, meaning an institution trying to find the criminality or the corruption itself, 18% and 1.9% by law enforcement. So, the reward law, the concept of giving a whistleblower, an insider, a monetary incentive to disclose corruption, wildlife trafficking, criminal activity, was first introduced in the United States by President Abe Lincoln on March 2nd, 1863, during the Civil War, when they needed help policing government corruption and corruption in government tenders and contracts. The law was modernized in 1986, and since 1986, this whistleblower reward law has become the most successful anti-fraud law in the United States. These next quotes come from the False Claims Act, the law that Lincoln signed and that was modernized in 1986. But they're statements from the top ranking law enforcement officials of the United States who have looked at their impact over the last 30 years. This is U.S. Attorney General. The impact of the reward laws has been nothing short of profound. Some of these cases have saved lives. They've all saved money. We know why. If the insider, if the whistleblower is your number one source, once you incentivize them and protect them, your detection abilities skyrocket. This is a statement from the Assistant United States Attorney General for the United States. This is the top law enforcement official with responsibility over fraud prosecutions, specifically civil fraud cases. And this is his quote. Whistleblower reward laws are the most powerful tool to protect against fraud. I want to emphasize something here. 
the assistant U.S. Attorney General who would know, who sits on top of the cases. He did not say that these reward laws were effective. He didn't say they were powerful or good. He said most powerful. I'll repeat that again. Most powerful. And that's what we see. How do we know this? How do we know this just isn't a speech of a politician or some attorney general looking for a bigger budget? How do we know that? And I'll tell you how. Once the government starts to pay rewards, they have to analyze every case and first determine whether there's a whistleblower and then determine whether they are going to pay the whistleblower. So every single fraud case covered under the False Claims Act is analyzed and you can prove that whistleblowing works to the penny. In other words, you can compare dollar to dollar. Let's see what happened in the 30 years this law was used. This chart called Sanctions Obtained from the United States. This shows how much money the U.S. government started to collect under the False Claims Act once it was modernized and permitted whistleblower rewards. You can start in 1980. I did this in three-year blocks to get a better view of things over time. And you can look and see 1985 to 1987, the U.S. government was collecting about $50 million a year. That's how much they could detect for all the fraud. They could prosecute and recover $50 million. bucks. It's kind of what they're getting now in wildlife trafficking maybe a little less, but that's where they were at. And now we can watch the progress as whistleblowers learned about the law, as more people filed claims, as cases were successfully adjudicated, and look where we are by 2012-14. The government is collecting about $9.5 billion, billion in that three-year block from 50 million. So when these officials are looking at these numbers, they realized that the whistleblower was the key. This next chart is just another way of looking at the same numbers. It breaks out what the whistleblower contribution is to the governments and total. So the bottom chart in blue, that's what the government is finding on its own. That's what they are uncovering. That's kind of where we are at in wildlife trafficking today. Without incentives, where your sources can be shot, there's no confidentiality, there's no monetary reward, there's no protection. We're kind of struggling at the bottom. Then you can see the red. This is the monies coming in from the whistleblower cases. And you can see by 2012, the whistleblower was about 80% of all the cases. Again, how do they know this? Because they have to pay an award. They have to categorize it. 
80%. And this is the raw numbers, by the way. Again, from the United States Department of Justice, they publish this every year. This is between 1987 and 2015. The United States collected, if you look at this, approximately $48 billion, billion in fraud recoveries. And the whistleblowers were directly responsible for 69% of those recoveries, $33 billion. And remember, this number is low because we're looking at recoveries from 1987 when the whistleblower program just started. Every year, it gets stronger and stronger. So you can look at this and just think about wildlife trafficking, the illegal trafficking in plants, illegal lumbering, illegal timbering in fish, unregulated fishing, improper fishing, and animals, including the murder and devastation of CITES protected animals. This is what we are looking at. The goal of our program is to revolutionize the detection by taking this program that has worked and using it for wildlife trafficking. So the first question you will have is, okay, that's good in the United States. Well, I don't live in the United States. I live in Asia. I live in Africa. I, I sail a boat. The animals are being shot down in Kenya. The forests are being chopped down in Russia. How's it going to help me? Well, four years ago, the United States implemented its first real whistleblower reward program for foreign corruption to pay whistleblowers money to report violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That would be the bribery of high-ranking government officials or any government official where these bribes occur in foreign countries. <clears throat> the crimes occur outside the United States. This law is applicable to wildlife trafficking. So not the direct trafficking, but if bribes are paid, this law is applicable and it has already been used to cover bribes paid in international ports. So in as much as bribes are paid in ports to either export wildlife or to allow it into a country, this law can be used. And let's see how it's being used. So these are now quotes from the chair of the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission. And this is the group that operates the whistleblower program for foreign corrupt practices under our law. This is where you go. And guess what? They're reporting the same things the Justice Department reported. It didn't matter if the whistleblower was in Tanzania, New York, or Russia. And this is their report, 2015. The SEC program is a success. 
Whistleblower tips are of a tremendous help stopping ongoing and imminent fraud, leading to significant enforcement actions. And here's the map of the world based on the SEC's own statistics. These are available online. Every country in black is where a whistleblower from that country has filed a claim in the United States under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. You can look down there at South Africa. That means a whistleblower who lives in South Africa has reported a bribe to a South African official, is participating in the program, and if there's a prosecution, can obtain a monetary reward. It's worldwide, it works. And this is the quote from the SEC. And I just gave a talk in Belgrade, Serbia, and I handed out the decision, the actual ruling of the SEC giving this $30 million. But here's what they said. In issuing $30 million award to foreign nationals, best effectuates the purpose of the award program. So I want to now just look at this for another moment. This means that they gave $30 million, and they've given more than that. They've given it to a lot of whistleblowers, to non-U.S. citizens who've reported bribery in their home countries. This is precisely what we're looking at for the wildlife trafficking laws. And that amount of money, in my assessment, is more money than has been paid to every whistleblower in the world outside the United States. It's a true incentive. And if we can work this program, which we shall do, to incentivize on wildlife trafficking, it will have a revolutionary impact. And here's again what the head of the SEC, responsible for this Foreign Corrupt Practices program, has said. The rewards create powerful incentives. That's what we need for informants to come with real evidence. That's what we need to meaningfully contribute. And that's what the rewards will do, because if the whistleblower is paid based on the quality of their information and the ability to have a successful law enforcement outcome, we're not talking about a small anonymous tip. We're talking about insiders incentivized to give real evidence that can be used in court and to meaningfully contribute. And I've been doing this for 30 years, by the way, and I know this is true. I've seen it every day. Today I have clients in Russia, China, Europe, the Baltics, the Middle East, South America, and I see what they're turning in because it's, the, because it's incentivized. They want to help and they want to make sure these crooks, despicable traffickers are held accountable. This is just a chart of the 95 countries that whistleblowers have come from since between 2011 and 2015. And I want to say something on this. 
the fact that 1,557 non-U.S. citizens from 95 countries have used this rewards law on foreign corruption is simply remarkable. But it is small numbers because most people don't even know these laws exist. I mean, how many people even on this call were aware that these laws exist? And I've gone around the world talking, and I tell you, nobody knows. These numbers are going to grow. I now want to just talk briefly, before we go directly to wildlife, about another U.S. reward law that is very similar to the wildlife trafficking laws. And this is the act to prevent pollution from ships. So why is it similar? The pollution from ships, like wildlife trafficking, the crimes originate outside the United States. So this law, pollution from ships, covers pollution on the high seas. To explain it better, for those of you who know all these conventions, the APPS, the Pollution from Ships Law, implements the Maripol Protocol, which prohibits boats, ships from over 100 countries from polluting on the high seas. And it's very similar to CITES because CITES is a convention that covers wildlife trafficking. So Maripol is to the oceans like CITES is to wildlife. And guess what? And this should be of no surprise based on the statistics we've gone over. The United States has a reward law for those who report Maripol violations. In other words, under this law, and I've reviewed the last 70 cases personally, almost all the whistleblowers are foreign nationals. They are from the Philippines, Korea, different countries. Very few. I think maybe one case there was a U.S. whistleblower. They're all foreign nationals. And the boats, the ships, are on foreign flagships. They're not U.S. owned ships. But guess what? With the reward law, and this is from the United States Department of Justice, all of these quotes are from court filings, is now the leading country enforcing Maripol. So by using the whistleblower rewards, the United States, where the crimes are not happening, and the ships aren't U.S. ships, is number one. And as our Justice Department has pointed out, very few countries have any track record prosecuting Maripol. Why they don't have a legal process to protect the witnesses? How can you prove a crime without a witness? And the, and the pollution at ships is like wildlife trafficking. When they dump the oil into the Indian Ocean, who sees it? The crew member. Without a crew member, you can't prosecute. How do you get the crew member to become a witness? That's what our Justice Department has said over and over. Absent the crew member, you can't uncover. Very difficult. Better yet, this is again from a Department of Justice pleading. The information is otherwise difficult. Well, that's an understatement. If not virtually impossible to obtain. The same 
goes for wildlife trafficking. How can you figure out what container on a gigantic freighter has ivory? Unless you have an insider to point it out. And even if you find the ivory, how are you going to get a conviction unless you have a whistleblower who can identify who is responsible and prove, say, for example, that the boat owner knew or that a bribe was paid? You need the insider. And paying a monetary reward is really the only way to do it. because it's the only way that a whistleblower can obtain protection. If you think it through, if you were thinking of blowing the whistle, if you were thinking of turning someone in and putting so much at risk, why would you do it? And if you, and if you can be protected through a reward, so your family can survive, so you can make some money on it. That, that, that does the trick, especially outside the United States where there may be no law. And that's exactly what the U.S. Department of Justice is saying. They've seen these cases. The reward reflects the reality of life at sea. In the context of wildlife trafficking, the reward reflects the reality of what's happening in Africa and Asia, what the people who would be the whistleblowers are facing. A monetary, again, back to what the Justice Department is saying, a monetary award rewards the crew member for taking the risk and provides an incentive to others. And that's what it's all about. Let's incentivize and reward honesty. Let's incentivize and reward people who do the right thing. From my perspective, I don't, when I see a whistleblower's career destroyed, or maybe their life threatened, to me that's a loss. That's a bad, bad thing. And someone can come to me and say, oh, they did the right thing. They're helping out. Man, but these people are suffering. So if there's a procedure to get them compensation and also let them proceed anonymously and confidentially, I say that's what I vote for. That's what I want to see used. And now once again, consistent with every other law. You already know what's coming here. Over time, the whistleblower is the number one source of all detection of all oil pollution and sh pollution from ships. No surprise here. We looked at the last 70 cases, each plea agreement or guilty verdict. And in 65% of those cases, we confirmed that the whistleblower was given a monetary reward. In 8%, there's just no information whatsoever, because we're going through court filings here. 27% a whistleblower was not identified. Does not mean there was not a whistleblower. It just means in the available court record, we couldn't see it. But in 65%, they paid the whistleblower money, and these are almost all, I think, 69, 75, all non-U.S. citizens reporting crimes that occurred outside the United States. So we looked at them all, and, and, and this is what's happening in this area. 80% of these ocean whistleblowers got the maximum reward, which was 50%. The largest award given to one whistleblower was $2.1 million. The largest amount was paid to 12 whist Filipino whistleblowers. They got a total of $5.2 million. 
and the average award in the 70 cases was $163,000. Not bad. And believe me, it's a good incentive. And now you can hold on to your seats. The United States has paid since 1986, under all of our reward laws, over $5 billion to whistleblowers. I say that not, not because it's a spectacular amount of money and it shows that whistleblowing works. I say that because it indicates that the U.S. government has been willing to live up to its end of the bargain. When these Filipino sailors, all 12 of them, turned in their ship, the U.S. lived up to its end of the bargain and gave them $5.2 million. That's the deal. And that's what we have to see happening in wildlife. When rewards start to be paid in wildlife trafficking cases, we will see a massive uptake in high quality reporting, in the ability to detect these crimes. We will see it. And I believe if what we've seen in ocean pollution or foreign corruption or government contracting, if these examples hold true, and there is no reason to think they will not, but if they hold true, I believe we can turn the corner and really get on the offensive and start tackling some of the most despicable and outrageous crimes that are occurring on Earth, the destruction of forests that are needed, the killing of endangered species, and the systemic and systematic violation of fishing laws. I'm watching my time, and uh, I'm going to just go over one other point because I think it's important. It's called restitution. What restitution under U.S. law means is when a fine or penalty is collected, the court can direct those penalties to be used for beneficial purposes. So the money can go back to the federal treasury, but it can also be used for beneficial purposes. So once again, I looked at the whistleblower cases from the Maripol ocean pollution, because we could see the plea agreements. And I wanted to know how the money was spent. The whistleblowers returning in these cases, who gets the money? Here it is. So they collected in these 70 cases approximately about 100, what, 185 million in penalties. And you can see in the blue, they gave whistleblowers $31 million in rewards. That's not a bad number. We already gave out that. And our government, the U.S. government, pocketed $110 million. Okay? But look at this last number. Restitution and community service, $44 million. Approximately 24%. What did that go for? This next slide shows where the money went. And what you can see, it went to NGOs, it went to nonprofits, it went to private public partnerships, and you can see what it was used for. 
scientific research, habitat conservation, public education, restoration of grass beds, etc. In other words, once we unleash the power of the whistleblower and we use them to detect these wildlife trafficking crimes, we bring the wrongdoers to justice and the criminals have to pay. Yes, the whistleblower can get a reward, but I would also urge every NGO, foreign governments, and anyone interested in actually winning the war against these traffickers to get involved like they have in the Maripol context and like they have an act to prevent pollution on ships and have the courts use some of those monies to support the NGOs, to support grassroots efforts to tackle wildlife trafficking. That can happen. So now let's look at the wildlife laws. And I would urge everyone to go to the website of the Whistleblower Center, www.whistleblowers.org. That's whistleblowers with an S. Because we have a lot of information about these laws on, on, on our website. And we're going to be posting a lot. They've been around for a while, but they've never been used. We rediscovered them through research last summer. And ever since then, we've been slowly trying to educate the government, NGOs, whistleblowers about these laws. As some of you may know, we obtained the grand prize through an AID, Amer Agency for International Development sponsored competition in partnership with Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic and Traffic. We competed and they gave us an award, a grand prize, to try to make people aware of these wildlife reward laws. Let's take them out of the closet Let's start using them. They were passed, these are the words of the U.S. Congress when they were passed into law. And as they said in the House report or Congressional report, they needed powerful tools to combat massive illegal trade in wildlife, which threatens the survival of numerous species. Congress, our Congress got it right. They knew that a whistleblower reward law was a powerful tool. It just hasn't been used. And this is how it goes. The whistleblower reward provision directs the secretary, and that's the secretary of interior, for Lacey Act, that covers most everything, illegal trafficking and all societies uh, covered items, but also the Secretary of Commerce for Fish, the Secretary of Agriculture for Timber and Logging, and the Secretary of Treasury to always make sure there's money there. They stuck in Treasury to make sure there's cash pay those whistleblowers. And that's what this law does. And this just is some of the laws covered under the reward provisions. It's actually about 50. So we have the Lacey Act, which covers trafficking, Peace Act, and then a slew of others. Rhinoceros and tiger conservation, Antarctic conservation, fish and wildlife improvement, wild bird. We just it just kind of goes on. And here's another list: African elephant conservation, American fisheries, Atlantic tunas, bald eagles, fur seal, 
illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh, migratory birds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These, if we get a successful prosecution, they can pay that whistleblower reward. Now, what is our program? What are we trying to do? Why am I here? This is our program. One, educate wildlife whistleblowers. In other words, we need to make the people who witness these crimes or have information about wildlife trafficking, including bribery, including customs violations, we need to make them aware of their right to obtain a monetary reward and how to go about it, how to go about protecting yourself. That's step one. Step two, create a secure and confidential way to report these crimes. We are not naive. We know that a whistleblower in Asia or Africa, or even in Europe, even in the United States, is at tremendous risk. So they need, we need to develop a way to, that these can be reported confidentially and securely. This is the heart of the prize we won from USAID and the, 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 the panel that gave us this award. It was a worldwide competition, as I said, was Smithsonian and National Geographic and Traffic and the USAID because they understood that you need a way to report. So by January of 2017, we will have at whistleblowers.org that can be filled out anywhere in the world in which people can securely and confidentially initiate this whistleblower disclosure process. Work with partners, step three. In the area of wildlife trafficking, in which most of our informants will be outside of the United States, many will not speak English, and the overwhelming majority will come from countries with a bad democratic infrastructure. In other words, if you get caught being a whistleblower, there's not, you don't have that many rights. Maybe you'll get killed and there'll be nothing to protect your family. We know that. So by working with NGOs that are concerned on these issues and responsible and government agencies that are responsible and trustworthy, these become the intermediaries. But now I'll let you in on a little secret. The Lacey Act and the other reward laws for wildlife permit NGOs to qualify for a reward. So let me explain that again. Under these laws, a corporation can qualify, non-governmental organization. And why is that so critical? The NGO can act as the intermediary. The NGO is at the grassroots. The NGO can work with the whistleblowers on the ground and can put together the information in a way that will be effective and transmit that into the United States to the lawyers we are organizing and file the claim and help with law enforcement. And this happens already. There are NGOs in various countries who are active in doing this. And these NGOs can pay the money back to the whistleblower or use the monies for beneficial purposes, but they qualify. The ability to have public interest oriented 
intermediary organizations bridging a whistleblower on the ground in Asia or Malaysia or China, bridging that to the United States, in my view, is also a key to the effectiveness of these laws. I'm now wrapping up because my hour is coming close. This is just us about our award. These are online resources. They'll be in the PowerPoint you have. I highly recommend that you look at them. I've also written a whistleblower's handbook. It's coming out a new edition in, 2000, in March of 17. It will have a whole section on wildlife and international anti-corruption. You should order it or get a review copy, whatever. We do trainings worldwide. This is a training I did in Sarajevo. That's the ambassador to the United States on the far left. They were very supportive. That's me. The next to the left after that is a, a great whistleblower advocate, Boyan, who is a big organizer there. It worked well. They passed a whistleblower law, in part sparked by these efforts. A little bio about myself, contacts, how to get a hold of us. So I want to thank everyone for your patience and for listening to this presentation. I hope it was understandable. Uh, we are more than interested in doing trainings around the world, in talking to people, in letting people know how these laws work, making them effective, and getting this program off the ground. I just want to mention one last point, which is we have a set of laws, not just the wildlife laws, but the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the False Claims Act, and many of them can be used in wildlife trafficking. So thank you so much for your time and patience, and uh, I'm more than willing to take any questions that people may have. Thank you. Many thanks, Mr. Khan. It is a really interesting topic on law and policy and illegal wildlife trade. Uh, I think countries can either create such laws or add targets that support implementation of such policies and laws on the implementation of MBSAP. I am sure our audience found your presentation really useful. I want to invite our participants to share your questions, doubts, and comments, or raise your hands to participate in, to participate in the Q&A session. Please use the control panel of the GoToWebinar platform to do that. We can open your microphone, or if you prefer, we can read your question uh, in the questions tab. I have just one hand raised from Yoganan Chandraya. I'm going to open the microphone. Yoganan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, can you can you let us know uh, what country you are connected and go ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, myself, Yoganan Chandraya, I'm from India. And uh, I've been closely working with the wildlife for the past 10 years. So uh, let me come to the question. So my question is, Khan, uh, please uh, you know, let me know, is there any checklist uh, that is framed uh, in order to make sure uh, my, uh, you know, my evidence or my, you know, like if I have found any crime, uh, whatever uh, I'm giving the evidence should be quality evidence. This is what I came to know. So, is there any checklist that is framed to uh, for the quality evidence? Should I follow any uh, standard operating uh, protocol for this? Uh, I, I'm going to try to answer the question. It was breaking up a little through the uh, microphone. I, I understand the question was, and correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a way to make sure that if you turn in the evidence, that it's known to be your evidence? Is that the question? Exactly. Okay, so yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And 
that's one of the reasons that if you're going to participate and become a whistleblower, we strongly urge you to get an attorney in the United States. And part of our program is to create such a network because you need to make sure that your information goes to the right people and you get credit for it. Now, under Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, there's an entire procedure where you can go anonymously and confidentially, they give you a number, and you can follow the proceeding. So that's very secure, and it works very well. The wildlife laws are being implemented now. They're still new. So my strongest recommendation is to make sure you have a lawyer and that you can document precisely what you turned in and then use your U.S. lawyer to make sure it's given to the correct offices that will be responsible for the prosecution. So in the 30 years of all these laws, I don't know of any case in which a whistleblower's information was used and that whistleblower did not have an opportunity to request a reward once they knew that these reward procedures existed. So you just have to, like anything in life, protect yourself and make sure it's well documented. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Con, uh, uh, I have one more question. So, uh, like uh, in the, uh, I think in the previous slide, I saw that there will be, uh, you know, uh, education is very important for the visual blower that is training. So, with that, I even felt like yes, uh, whatever the session today was also very helpful and it's highly appreciable. Uh, with that, uh, is there any? Uh, or prerequisites or something, tools or equipments given to the visual blower in prior uh, uh, that could help him to, uh, you know, uh, track the uh, wildlife crime or fraud. That is, the equipment could be hidden camera or anything like a recorder, something like that. Yes. Well, in the act, in the pollution, in the ocean pollution cases. Cell phones have turned out to be incredibly useful law enforcement tools mm -hmm. where they've used their cell phones to take pictures of the dumping of the oil and to record people. But you do have to be careful using a cell phone okay. because they may need to use it in evidence and you want to make sure that your cell phone is clean, that you don't have things on your cell phone that are very private or personal because that might get introduced. So cell phones have been very effective. Uh, so it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I want to say that one thing that the reward laws do that other whistleblower laws do not accomplish is that we see high-ranking corporate officials who would never be a whistleblower become whistleblowers because they want to do the right thing and with a monetary incentive they feel they can have some form of economic security. So for example, if an executive vice president or a chief compliance officer from a major shipping company becomes a whistleblower. They may already have data on complaints and issues that have come up within their industry about smuggling. It's amazing how much information is turned in internally to a company 
and they know about it, but they never report it. So in, in these wildlife crime cases, you should be looking at both places. You should be looking at the grassroots, but also using these laws to induce higher ranking people. Because believe me, if you get an executive vice president or a chief compliance officer of a major shipping company that has evidence that this shipping company has been smuggling, uh, you've got a great case. It could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, uh, I'm ready for the next question. Thank you. Okay. I have a raised hand from Christian, Christian Barlow. Hold on. Hello, Christian. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Please, um, uh, let I'm, us know uh, your country and, and your question. Thank you very much. I'm living in Laos and I work in Southeast Asia on wildlife crime. My question is if, if these offenses aren't directly linked to the United States, for instance, rhino horns coming from South Africa into Watai Airport, Vientiane in Laos, and then from there transiting to Vietnam, and we know who the corrupt customs officers are at the airport, but there's no direct connection to the United States. Do these laws still apply? They can. And the, the transnational reach of these laws is far than many people think. Because th the best example I can give are the prosecutions that were initiated for the bribes paid at the World Cup, FIFA, where you could see how they were using U.S. laws to prosecute bribes paid outside the United States by non-U.S. people. And all the crimes were occurring outside. But you can look at things like banks, emails, which are mail transactions, and even the definition of what is a U.S. person can be very broad. For example, under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you can be a company that has no business or property in America and still be considered a covered company. Vessels are big targets because when they amended the Lacey Act, to include the whistleblower provision. They also included a provision for the seizure of vessels used to transport illegal wildlife. Anything occurring in a customs port, if they're paying money to customs officials, could trigger foreign corrupt practices that has very broad international scope. So the answer to your question is if you have an insider and if you're working closely with uh, lawyers who know what they're doing and you can contact us, uh, the, uh, the chance that you can get a U.S. prosecution is very high. That may not mean you can get it tomorrow. In, in many of the most important prosecutions. You sit and you wait. You watch the networks. You try to gather as much evidence as you can. And when you get one conspirator that you can nail in the United States, you can begin the prosecution. So the, it is a complete misconception that these U.S. laws do not apply worldwide. And that is why my slides on the, for I use those slides on the foreign corrupt practices. So it's just a balance. Some cases, absolutely yes, you got them. Some cases, but in reality, 
It's always the damn middle ground. It's always somewhere in that gray area. And in that gray area, if you have an insider and if you're able to collect evidence, I believe you will get the U.S. connection because someone will have a green card. Someone will have a bank account in America. There will be some way to get it. One of the vessels will be a publicly traded company. And, all pu and publicly traded companies we can get. So what is best to do is to work with the experts and try to see if you can tackle it uh, uh, under these laws. And if so, I think that's the trick. So uh, I, that's what I, my strongest recommendation. And you can contact us just at uh, whistleblowers.org. You can contact me personally at consul at kkc.com and we can have someone talk with talk with you later. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Andrea Crosta. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead with your question and your country, please. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so this is Andrea Crosta. Um, our organization, Elephant Action League, launched uh, Wide Leaks a couple of years ago, which is the, basically the world first whistleblowing initiative for wildlife crime. Um, it, it's a very interesting proposition, the one that you know an NGO can, like us, working in the field, that can uh, act as a point of contact with the source. I think it's very useful. Uh, in many countries, it would be basically impossible to have a source coming forward uh, as an official whistleblower um, uh, unless you have a you can uh, you know you can send it to another country uh, my question is is the financial reward linked only to a successful prosecution uh, I'm saying that because we we might get some arrest maybe locally but in general in the world the, the rate of prosecution for wildlife crime is very very low so you might not never get to um, a successful prosecution well that is a very very good question and what I'm going to do is go back to a slide I skipped over and, and address it. So first, there is a law in the United States and is the only whistleblower reward law that permits a reward based on a violation not a prosecution. And this law covers every U.S. wildlife trafficking law for plants, fish, and animals. It covers them all. It was like a, uh, an umbrella. And it's the only one that says the violation triggers the right to a reward versus a successful prosecution. All other laws, you need the prosecution. Second, it's the only whistleblower law that authorizes these agencies, these government agencies, and this would be Fish and Wildlife and uh, Marine Fisheries, to use budget money, general money, to pay a reward. So. It doesn't have to come from the prosecution. So your first, the answer to your first question is yes, it's possible for the violations. And we see this as very important because if you can offer ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar rewards to people who give good information about a violation before you get a prosecution, I think that could really help in enforcement. Absolutely. But what I also want to address is this, the thing that the reward does, which is very different from the TIPS programs that are, a lot of people have, including Fish and Wildlife, you can go on their website and give them a tip. This is the difference, and this is a quote, it's the slide I have up now from the head of the SEC, again, who has the jurisdiction over foreign bribery. And why I like this is because this commission had a terrible reputation with whistleblowers. In other words, 
up until about 2010, and I took whistleblowers there. It was terrible. They didn't listen to them. It was awful. Then they had this whistleblower program. Look what they say. This is why they love it now. The whistleblower program has rapidly become a tremendously effective force multiplier generating high quality tips and in some cases virtual blueprints laying out an entire enterprise. What we see when you have the monetary incentive, the quality of information can significantly increase because the whistleblower now is completely invested in the successful prosecution. So that this is another key. It's not just getting more tips and more informants. It's trying to cultivate those informants that can deliver the information for a successful prosecution. I also want to say thank you so much for participating because I think we can work together on integrating the TIPS program uh, and integrating these reward concepts to the very fine program that you've already initiated. Absolutely, with pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, I have um, another question. I'm going to read it. It's, uh, can you please shed more light on the management structure involved to successfully implement the laws related to whistleblowers? Okay, excellent question. So you need two pieces to do it right. You need a place for the whistleblower to go where you get someone on the whistleblower's team, team whistleblower, on their side, their advocate. That can be an NGO, that can be a private attorney, that can be both. No whistleblower should ever go it alone. That is a prescription for disaster. In my handbook, my whistleblower's handbook, I have a whole chapter about what I call self-help. When a whistleblower decides just to blow the whistle and they often go to the wrong office, they tell the wrong people, they miss their deadline, they may do things that make their evidence inadmissible in court so it can never be used. If you go it alone, it's gonna, it, there's a very strong chance outcome. So you need an NGO that knows what they're doing, is committed. You also need most likely an attorney or some advocate that understands how to blow the whistle, to whom to blow the whistle, and the type of evidence you need to make it worthwhile. Because when people contact me today, if they don't have good enough evidence, I tell them, why risk your job? Why risk your life? Get better evidence and come back. So you need someone on your team. Second, you need a place in the United, in the government that is trustworthy and that you can go to. And right now, I only recommend people filing in the United States. I, I have not seen enough evidence that any other country in the world operates a whistleblower enforcement program that I think is safe and that will actually pay rewards and protect whistleblowers. I just haven't seen it. I'm hoping they exist. I'm willing to work with people to help create them, but today I just don't make that recommendation. I've had people come from many countries and I say, you know, 
I don't recommend going to like the German authority. I just don't recommend it. Okay, so you need an office. So where does that leave us? In the United States of America, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, was off, has set up a whistleblower office. And it is the state of the art. You can get confidentiality and anonymity. I've worked with them on many cases. They're professional. They have a computerized program. So if a whistleblower comes in, any law enforcement person can go on a database and see if there's a whistleblower. They're paying rewards. As I said, internationally, they've paid over 30 million already. Very good office. They have rules, they have procedures. They're the model. We are now working with the, the, the agencies that cover wildlife, which would include the four departments I mentioned, agriculture, interior, which is fish and wildlife, Department of Commerce, which includes NOAA and marine fisheries, and the Department of Agriculture for timber. And it is our goal that they set up a that they set up whistleblower offices and act like the SEC. But in the interim, we're filing cases and seeking rewards. We filed our first reward application about a month ago. Uh, seeking a reward and we're following that process so it, it's it's a work in art it, and and that's why if you're doing wildlife only you really absolutely need to be working with NGOs and lawyers at this time but uh, the US has done a good job and we're I'm very optimistic Remember, you can send your question through the questions tab in the GoToWebinar platform or raise your hand. We have space for, for a couple of questions. I'm going to read one of them. What role can foreign, foreign governments play in, the, in this movement? Well, foreign governments can play a very important role. First off, if there are officials who have information about illegal trafficking, but are afraid of retaliation in their own countries, they can give that information to responsible NGOs, and those NGOs can help bring that information forward in a way that rewards can qualify. Also, we have, I have met with high-ranking government officials, I've even met with the president of one country and the, in another country their uh, minister of justice, uh, anti-corruption commissions and we are more than willing to work with governmental agencies to try to help them develop whistleblower programs that will be effective and that's something that we look forward to and I hope there's interest we will also work with uh, international bodies be it the UN or the World Bank or whomever uh, if they want to set up programs to take advantage of whistleblower reward laws as the key to fraud detection. And I think that would just be fantastic if, if other governmental agencies and international bodies uh, followed the U.S. model. I can't emphasize enough that it works. I literally could do the whole hour presentation and just put up slides of statistics and charts and all I need to say is it works and give you another slide it works it works and on the other side of this it you can't put everything on the whistleblower you know I've represented them for 32 years now and and, and I met so many incredible incredible whistleblowers, people who have sacrificed so much, who've been willing to put so much, I mean these are just incredible people. But my own opinion has changed. 
It's like, I am heartbroken. Why do they have to take such risks? Why do they, the whistleblower, have to suffer so much? It's wrong. There are programs to address this that allow confidentiality, anonymity, rewards. These programs exist. They are working. So my challenge to every government is simple. If you want an effective anti-corruption program, if that's what you want, you have to have a whistleblower program because they're your source of information. It is proven. And to have a whistleblower program that works, you have to have incentives and rewards, not just small token rewards. You want rewards that will induce high-ranking officials to come forward. You want the big fish. We know how to do it, and we're willing to work with any government in the world to help put this through. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. Uh, unfortunately, the time, the time is over. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time and for your presentation, and thank you all for for being here in this uh, session of the MBSAF Forum webinar. Please check out our website, uh, mbsafforum.net, in order to get uh, the list of resources provided by this webinar, a PDF copy of this, present, a copy of this presentation, and the recording link so you will be able to, to watch it. Mr. Khan, I'm not sure if you have final words to, for, for the presentation. I do. I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. And Diego, I want to thank you personally for helping put this together and your professionalism. And so thank you so much. And thank everyone for listening and participating. Stay tuned for our next webinar in December. More information in our website in the NBSA forum or through our social media accounts in Facebook and Twitter. Remember, register or update your profile and send us your thoughts on webinar topics you would like to discuss in future sessions. I'm Diego Choa from the NBSA Forum. Feel free to send us all your suggestions and recommendations. I hope all of you enjoyed these sessions and please have a nice day, afternoon or night. Thank you very much and I hope to see you in the next session uh, in one month. Bye.